Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Francine Lacquan. I could not be more delighted uh, to be with you on this final panel to look at the Global Jobs Recovery Plan. I was looking at some of the uh, wonderful, actually, research that they put together, an estimated 200 155 million full-time jobs globally could have been destroyed because of COVID-19. So the point of the session, of course, try to understand how countries can pivot towards investment into emerging high-quality jobs of tomorrow. And we have a really star-studded panel to help us along. Alan Blue, co-founder of LinkedIn. Sharon Burrow, General Secretary, International Trade Union uh, Confederation. James Laurie, Jim Laurie, uh, Chief Executive Officer Stanley Black & Decker. Jeff Manjokalda, Chief Executive of Coursera and Guy Ryder, Director General, International Labor Organization. So thank you all uh, for joining us on a very important topic. And I remind everyone that you can also ask your own questions. So please feel free to do it often. Um, when you look at exactly the last 12 months and how it's changed the way we work, technology having displaced all of the workers, Guy, maybe kick us off in trying to figure out how you think technology and the pandemic has changed it. Is the pace of change accelerated? Or has it just changed the course for the jobs of tomorrow? Well, for most people, we've gone backwards at a very high velocity. I mean, let's, let's be very frank about it. That, that figure of 255 million full-time job equivalents lost in, in 2020 is the most dramatic figure we've seen in, this, uh, well, in, in modern uh, industrial history. Uh, and we're just looking now, trying to project forward from that deep, deep hole in labour markets, by the way, which has brought massive increases in poverty, increases in child labour, increases in forced labour. This is the big story. And, and, and the rest, frankly, has to be viewed in the context of, of that reality. Now, we're looking forward from that deep hole of 2020. What do we see? Well, the report we've just launched today shows that by the end of next year, 2022, we won't have got back in quantitative terms the volume of jobs lost uh, through the pandemic. We reckon the world will still be down by about 23 uh, million jobs. So this is a very grave crisis. Now, now how has technology affected this? And, and the interesting thing is this, this drama has been superimposed on ongoing processes of change, those uh, brought about by technological innovation, also those that have been brought out with much more to come on the road to climate neutrality, demographic change, much else. My view is technology has, has really helped us through this, uh, this pandemic because, you know, very obviously, and others I'm sure can speak to this with great authority, it's enabled a lot of people to continue to work, it's enabled economies to continue to function. It seems to me inherently probable that that experience has accelerated and will make permanent processes of change that were uh, already uh, on the way. But I would warn, as I habitually do in these conversations, about any uh, sort of falling into a notion of technological determinism, that because technologies are becoming available, that's where we're going. That is what we're going to happen. Are we on a road to generalised remote working? I don't know. I'm not even sure that that's a desirable outcome. But what it does offer is choice, I think. It enables us to construct ways of working uh, which haven't been available to us before and which could be highly beneficial. But we're in a bad place. Let, let, let's please start from that understanding. The world of work is in a very bad place right now. Alan, what kind of, I mean, not all sectors are created equally, like Guy Ryder was saying, right? Some jobs have, been, have gone, I guess, new ones have been created. From your point of view, what's been, I guess, the biggest legacy of the pandemic in the last 12 months? So before the pandemic, uh, we saw this substantial shift towards the world of technology-focused jobs. And basically, the pandemic has accelerated that. Uh, so we're seeing probably the addition of 150 million technology-enabled jobs over the next five years worldwide. And that's a huge opportunity for people um, because these jobs are much in demand, tend to be very high paid. Um, so it's an interesting transition, but a difficult transition for most people to get through. Um, that's an acceleration. If I were to point to, to one of the things which has uh, been a lasting impact, though, I would say it's a lasting impact on the progress for equity in the economy uh, in two ways. First, we think that Internationally, women have lost one or two years of progress in terms of their ability to uh, 
uh, to participate fully in the workforce. Um, you know, we, we know for sure the pandemic hit women much more, uh, much harder than it did men. Secondly, the pandemic is receding unevenly around the world. And that unevenness, unfortunately, is going to, or has the potential to very substantially uh, increase inequity globally. Uh, if we recover at 6.5% 6 6 in the United States, while Africa is beset by the virus for two more years, that's a huge amount of potential lost ground. Thank you so much, um, Alan. Sharon, where do you see, I mean, you know, Guy started by pin painting a really pretty bleak p picture. Do you see anything that's, you know, that that's horrific at the moment, but actually as economies reopen, you get jobs back? Or do you really worry about, you know, the, futures of, the future of all workers? Well, we certainly worry about jobs because Saudi has said it, we need a social as well as an economic recovery, and you can't have one without the other. And we know that if we were to go back to the heart of a social contract, which is the security of having a job, then full employment would mean we needed about 575 million jobs at a participation rate of 75%, which is a little below the EU target. And the majority of those jobs have to be for women. So we do believe that investment in the transition for climate, that technology can create jobs, but it will only create jobs in a net drive towards full employment if we're conscious of where we've lost and will continue to lose jobs and how we repair what is basically a broken labour market. So we've said that... First of all, when you're talking about the formal economy, we need 575 million new jobs. The majority of them for women have to be inclusive of young people. But we also need to see that the informal economy is indeed formalised to the extent we can. So if we're going to reach the SDG target of uh, goal eight by 2030, we also need to add to that jobs target a, uh, a formalisation of one billion jobs on the planet that are currently informal. Now, Guy presided over the ILO Centenary Declaration and it was very clear in a tripartite negotiation that all workers, irrespective of their employment arrangements, had to have a basic floor of labour rights and protections fundamental rights, of course, the right to freedom of association, collective bargaining, to be free from discrimination, child or forced labour, but also occupational health and safety. COVID shown us just how vulnerable workplaces can be. And we needed a minimum living wage or an adequate living wage evidence base so people can live with dignity and, of course, then share prosperity through collective bargaining. But we also need some control over maximum hours of work. And those of you who've watched the explosion in telework in your own workplaces, while Guy's right, it's still the minority, nevertheless, you know that the right to disconnect, the right to actually manage a sanity between work and life is really important. So jobs have to be at the heart of it. We've called for every government to have a jobs plan and you know, I was thrilled by the launch, Sadia, of the partnerships because we need those targets. We also should recognise that in the context of those targets and the figures Guy used about the loss, a massive loss of working hours, 80 million people actually left the labour market. No hope. Many of them, the majority of them are women, and we need to look at what it will take, indeed, as Alan said, to speed up the participation of women to get even back to where we were, but certainly to get to equal participation with it, which is the policy aim of everybody. So this is a critical area. And I would just remind people that having a job, a secure job, is about trust and opportunity and optimism for the future. So it is, that's what we talk about is the dignity of labour. I am actually getting quite a lot of questions that we'll get to in a second about how to address, um, you know, the issue that women and minorities have suffered the most from the pandemic. Um, Jim, what can global businesses like yours actually do to help workers transition? Mm. 
I think you need to unmute. It's very 2021. Yeah. Sorry about that. The uh, This whole concept of job creation is, is necessary and, and very real and very relevant. However, there's another twist to it, which, you know, corporations are facing related to skills mismatch. And, you know, we have in the United States over a million open jobs and we cannot find people to fill the jobs that have the requisite skills. So this whole concept of how do we uh, change that imbalance in the countries that are coming, you know, back from an economic uh, meltdown into uh, a, a, a robust environment and we have labor shortages and so on. And so, uh, you know, there are short term solutions to it. But there's also there also has to be long term and medium term strategies to go go with it. And corporations do have a role to play. And, you know, I we're a very socially responsible company. We have a corporate social responsibility strategy. It, it has three elements. The first element is to empower 10 million makers. And this is by you know 2030. Uh, and then second, innovate with purpose. And then the third is to positively impact the environment. And we have quantitative you know, carbon uh, neutral, carbon positive goals and other goals related to packaging and recycling and, and, and so forth in that leg of the, of, uh, of the strategy. But leg number one is all about skilling and reskilling. And for us, uh, you know, we have over 100 plants around the world. And this is very much a local issue because many of these plants are in locations that are not that don't have access to uh, the the type of uh, talent and skills that are required to fill those jobs. So we essentially have to take the existing workforce, which is great because that is socially responsible, and we have to upskill them. And the way the solutions to this generally need to be local in nature. So local uh, public-private partnerships uh, at, at plant locations for the hourly workforce are definitely a solution and, and one that we're pursuing in the vast majority of our plants. Now, when we get to uh, this challenge to empower 10 million makers, and that essentially means upskilling them for, for our company, we are in the process of uh, defining a, a five-year challenge, if you will, series of challenges, which I think will be funded in the 20 to $30 million level. And every year we'll be releasing grants and funds to empower uh, 501c3 nonprofit organizations and NGOs and even startups to go out and, and find ways to help upskill, you know, the maker community, the, the labor community, if you will. Uh, and we're very excited about that. We'll probably be launching that in a couple, uh, couple of months, maybe October. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to the um, salary workforce, uh, interestingly, so the acceleration, uh, the accelerating pace of technological change has created this environment where salary workers and hourly workers need to constantly be upskilling themselves and the company needs to be supporting that. And so, you know, we have established relationships with uh, with Jeff's organization, Coursera, and we've trained, uh, we've had have given our people thousands of courses, uh, the self-administered courses through his platform, another platform called Percipio, uh, another one from PwC that does digital uh, digital digital uh, awareness training and 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 as well as internally curated. Uh, platform as well. So very, very intensive upskilling program for the for for the uh, both workforces, uh, hourly and salary uh, as we go here. But it's essential and it's not it's essential within the company and it's essential to do what we can for society. And that's that empower 10 million makers by 2030. Thank you, Jeff. What are some of the um, you know jobs that the workers are actually trying to reskill for? Well, so I, I think when you asked about the legacy of uh, pandemic looking back, I think right now it's been, you know, a, a lot of suffering and a lot of inequality uh, that has had a huge impact on certain populations more than others. If we went out five or 10 years and then look back, hard to say what it's going to look like, but I think there are two major features that will be remembered as being fundamental. That really starts with what Alan said. There will be you know, 150 million or so Microsoft estimates jobs that require digital skills. There's a couple things I think are very promising about that. If, if we recognize not every job is going to require digital skills, but there will be a larger and larger share of jobs and job opportunities that will be based on digital skills. The couple things that are very, I think, important to note, digital jobs 
can often be learned on digital platforms. Okay, so the ability to get learning opportunities, no matter where you are, very affordable, very accessible, often administered through institutional collaborations, I think is to some degree something we see now post pandemic or in, in the early stages that we didn't see before. And not only the, er the ability to get job opportunities uh, where you learn to, to do the skills of the job, but also with remote work. And at Coursera, I, over half the people we're hiring now are not near an office. Now, that's not going to be true for every company. It's not going to be true for every job. But increasingly, more and more job opportunities will be available to people, even if the job opportunity is not in their city or their state or their country. If we can have learning opportunities for anyone, job opportunities increasingly for anyone, I think it does create an opportunity to have much more fair distribution of learning and work. And I think that to a large degree, you know, digital is part of what's going to create that kind of opportunity. And we're seeing really great institutional collaborations to seize this kind of an opportunity. Guy, do, do you see any opportunity anywhere? I mean, you painted a, a pretty bleak picture at the start, 255 million full-time jobs globally lost that have been destroyed. When economies get better, when we fully reopen, how many of those jobs are actually back and how many will be people that don't, you know, cannot reskill, that, that won't be able almost to find a job in their lifetime? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, despite that perhaps overly bleak start I gave to the conversation, recovery is underway, and we see in certain economies, you know, great job creation. I mean, the, the world is creating jobs again, and that has to be good news. And there, I think, can be no doubt whatsoever that those who are able in the position uh, to acquire digital skills are going to be very well placed to take advantage of them. But I, I want to come back to what Alan said, and I... And I, I admitted to say it in my first comments, you know, incomplete as this recovery is, um, it is also extremely unequal for reasons which have been referred to already. And this is dramatically important because it will add to the burdens of existing inequality. I think there are three factors that we need to look at here. You might say I'm looking too short term in the conversation, but I'll say it anyway. One is this simple issue of, 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 of vaccine distribution. You know, vaccine pol health policy is now economic policy. The way vaccines are rolled out and where they're rolled out has a massive importance for the contours of economic recovery. And we know the story there. The bad news is that that first factor is compounded and exacerbated by the unequalness of fiscal space available to our different countries. The IMF tell us that 16 trillion US dollars has been spent in trying to mitigate and get out of this crisis. But we know where that money has been spent by and large and fully understandably it's been spent mostly by rich countries, uh, which are now on the bounce back uh, for their own folks. You know, if you go to a, a lower income country, it looks very, very different. And the third compounding, and the problem is it all goes in the same direction. The third compounding factor, and it comes very strongly out of the conversation that we are having, is that connectivity. If, if this ability to take advantage of, of digital opportunity uh, is where we're going, well, you know, some of the world is connected, but a hell of a lot of the world is not connected. Our estimate is the number of jobs that can be, that can be done remotely in the global economy is 18%, 1-8% right now. That goes up a lot more in some economies than others. But put those three factors together. Unless we act on those three, push some buttons to make those three variables change, you know, we're not on the road to a benign recovery. I'm fearful that we're on the road that will work for some but simply will not work for others. And then we have this unequal, unfair world. And I wish I could share, I, I hope Alan's right about women's exclusion and the bounce back there. It looks pretty grim right now. Nine out of every 10 women who've lost their jobs in this, um, uh, in this pandemic, they've left the workforce. They haven't become unemployed, they become inactive. And pulling them back is, is really quite a big job to do. And, and I won't go into youth because you're, I, I've spoken too long already, but it's pretty similar there. Yeah, and Jeff actually made the point right now that actually, you know, childhood education will be critical to mitigating inequality, which is actually the question that we have from Patrick. So thank you, Patrick, for sending that question in. How can we address the issue that women and minorities have suffered the most? Before I go to, to Jeff on this, are you proponing, is it debt relief? And do you see a willingness amongst leaders of maybe more developed economies to try and help the whole world out for this jobs recovery plan? Or does it feel like it's each to their own? 
The answer to your first question is yes. The answer to your second question is no. <laughs> that is to say, you know, we are going to find a lot of countries under, particularly if, you know, inflation ticks up and we get interest rates moving, we're going to find a hell of a lot of countries in situations of debt stress. And that's going to, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, damage their possibilities of moving forward. Do we see international leaders reacting? Well, we've had a little bit on debt service relief coming out of the G20. I think SDRs in the IMF could be a big story. But I think we've got to look a bit more broadly at how, uh, you know, fiscal space is distributed around the world. We've got some big issues around taxation to have conversations about in the future as well. But um, uh, that, that's how I think I can respond to, to the point you make. Francine. Um, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, 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 the possibility that inequality gets worse for a lot of the reasons that Guy mentioned uh, are absolutely you know, right there. It, on the one hand, the opportunity to have uh, the ability to learn new skills digitally and to do jobs remotely is incredible. But if you don't have connectivity, neither will you be able to learn those skills. Generally speaking, I mean, access to physical education infrastructure if you're an adult is, is, is limited, especially in the countries that have the surging population growth. But also, increasingly, if job opportunities require connectivity because those job opportunities might not be domiciled in your country, if you don't have, if you don't have connectivity, you're going to be basically uh, shortchanged on the learning opportunities and the job opportunities. So I think governments really need to be focused on connectivity like electricity and water and, 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 and basic needs. And then child ed childhood education, the, the basics of reading and writing, literacy, mathematics, the basic building blocks are requirements if you want to be an entry level, almost any digital job. You, know how, you have to know how to write and read and some, some basic mathematics. So I, I think that the underpinnings of connectivity and education are going to be requirements of harnessing this digital future to create more rather than less inequality. Alan, you, so, yeah, Sharon, go ahead. Well, I wanted to pick up on that because I think there are what I call scaffolding factors we need to pay attention to. Education and skills is clearly one of them. And I'm so pleased to hear Jeff start with early childhood. We all know it's actually the best economic investment for the long term, but it's also one of the best human investments. And if you had childcare, and we absolutely talk about investment and care as one of the key sectors of getting those jobs, because you not only get a huge multiplier impact for the economy, you take the burden of care off women and allow them to participate either in good jobs in childcare, aged care, health, education, or indeed in the broader economy. But education more broadly, we have to think of in three tranches. One is the early years through formal schooling. The second is indeed the school to work transition. And here, again, you have a gender discrimination piece that is huge. Like I've sat on skills councils in my own country with employers and workers, and we absolutely revered apprenticeships and the curriculum, but have a look at what happens to women who never get a chance at an apprenticeship. They're often, if any, skill based in the transition to work in low-level traineeships without qualifications and so on. And then in the workplace, and I want to address Jim's point on this because, you know, I was pleased to hear the discussion in the last round about how efficient it is to uh, actually retrain or lifelong learning or upskilling or whatever term you want to use rather than hiring and firing and wanting ready-made skills. Now, I know Jim's company. I've worked with him before, and I suggest to all of you that he's one of the people conscious of decent supply chains because it's got a model of actually producing for the domestic economy, not just relying on low-wage jobs to produce for, for developed economies. But I do think we have to really think through where's the responsibility for both reskilling and and indeed lifelong learning that gives you those that skills flexibility but also where's the income mix and if we don't have social protection that is a broader concept obviously a, a floor for resilience for personal or national or global shocks but also if you need a period of a, a period out reskilling sweden's got one of the best models 
employers and workers say they will fund with government support but with their own contributions a period. Now, in the developed world, that's possible. In the developing world, we have to look at what just development models mean. It does start with connectivity, Jeff, but it also is really about how we finance social protection and education. So there are the opportunities there and business can, in fact, build on them. Alan, we started the conversation with you saying, you know, women and minorities have fallen back maybe by two years in terms of the glacial progress that we've made. And yet you speak to the chief executives, you speak to world leaders, and they say we're rebuilding better. A number of, you know, chairmen at banks have also said maybe it's time that a female takes my place. Do you see a, a catalyst? Are, are we going to rebuild better? Even if now we've taken a back step, is it going to get better quite quickly or is it just talk? So I know that the last 18 months have been an opportunity for companies to think about the ways in which they want to contribute to a more equal future. So just listen to what Jim was saying earlier. Um, you know, I think it's a fantastic training makers. I think it's a fantastic contribution. I know literally hundreds of companies which have plans, ideas, things that they want to put in place. A lot of those things are relative to the size of the need, just a small piece. However, I will guarantee you that there are a bunch of companies out there with only a little bit of encouragement will invest very heavily in making those changes happen. Um, I wanna, I'm, I'm saying it that way specifically because we're in a position right now where we have some parts of the economy and some parts of job creation, which are... It, growing very, very fast. And I think we should all take as much advantage of those things as we possibly can. If I'm, I mean, uh, putting myself in the shoes of a, of, of a member of government is really hard. But if I'm in, in government, I want to have something which is going really, really well to allow me then to invest in the things which are going less well. So what I would love to do is say, wow, we've got a bunch of corporate partners. They've signed up for a bunch of stuff. We, have loved, we know that if we participate, at least to a small extent, in this massive growth on technology jobs with the gigantic economic benefits which come from them, maybe I've now got a part of the work that we're doing, which is working great. And now I can say, all right, now let's do it in a way which is more inclusive. Let's do it in a way which thinks more about the long-term future and development. Uh, at LinkedIn, we've always called these rivers, places where the water is flowing fast. Let's take advantage of that water in order to power the entire economy. To be clear, I'm not trying to say that it's easy, and I'm not trying to say that it's uh, just simple to, to, to focus on these things, but there is strong motion and opportunity for power there. So I think people need to take advantage of it. Thank you. Jim, I have a good question, which goes back to actually what Sharon was saying. This is from Pablo Felix, who writes in and saying, look, he has a question on capabilities and new behaviors. So he says, in addition to focus on specific capabilities, such as collaboration, creative thinking, and resilience, what is the best way to speed up the growth curve of these capabilities? How, you know, I don't know if it's a DNA of a company or a DNA of, of how to learn new skills, but is there a best way to internalize some of these new behaviors? Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of companies in the last X number of years have been leaning towards this uh, concept of social responsibility and having an impact in some of these areas. But I think it's really generational. I think the, um, especially the second half of the millennial generation and then Gen Z folks coming into the workforce, they're demanding, you know, they're demanding a commitment to ESG and in particular, E and S, you know, so, you know, the environmental commitments as well as social awareness and, and commitment to, you know, be a force for good in society. It's a, this is real. You know, I talked to um, uh, some of the wealth uh, management folks at, at one of the big firms in New York, and they were telling me that there are, uh, there are generations inheriting uh, wealth that are insisting on only investing in ESG conscious companies. Uh, and they're literally changing their parents' portfolios upon inheriting the money and the wealth. And so it, you, you can't really see this yet, and it, it, but this is a massive force. This is a financial force that is to be reckoned with. And companies that don't pay attention to ESG 
uh, are really going to be are going to are going to be hurt by the capital markets and vice versa. So, uh, you know, there, I, I, I'm involved in it and I got involved in it because I really believe in it. But I think you know the, there's going to be a a wave of uh, ESG coming over the transom, which has been amplified by the reality that we just went through an existential crisis and uh, these problems that we have in society, these massive problems, whether it's climate or inequality or racial justice, whatever they might be, uh, they need to be dealt with. And everyone understands that governments alone can't deal with them. Corporations alone can't deal with them. And the only way to really deal with them is to partner up and figure it out. And I would only add, you're not not gonna be hurt only by the financial markets by the labor markets as well. At LinkedIn, you know, millions of people get jobs on a regular basis. Those people look for those, they look for companies who align with their values because, especially if they're pursuing one of these in-demand jobs, they're in charge. They're in charge of the table in terms of that negotiation. And they can pick from many companies, which are possibilities. They're going to basically push companies towards adopting ESGs uh, on diversity, on climate, on a lot of things. Jeff and Guy, but first to Jeff, the same question to both of you. So half the global workforce probably needs upskilling. How will this be paid for? So what kind of agreement do we need between employees, governments, companies, universities, and unions? Jeff? Yeah, you know, I think that it's going to take all sorts of shapes, even if you just looked at Coursera, just as an, as an example. Uh, so there are about 82 million learners on Coursera. We, we offer uh, learning directly to individuals. Anyone in the world who has connectivity can come to Coursera and, and many other sites, by the way. And they can uh, watch course lectures for free and they can pay $49, as different in different regions, to complete courses. They can also earn full college degrees, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. Of course, those are a little bit more expensive. Interestingly, I think institutions have really stepped into the game in a much bigger way during the pandemic. We launched Coursera for Business five years ago and saw a lot of businesses say, you know, we need to reskill and upskill people, honestly, starting with machine learning, AI, those skills that aren't really in the labor market at all. We have to create them. So let's go through that digital transformation. The pandemic really caused a lot of other institutions, governments and universities to really step in as well. And what we're really excited about is we see institutional collaborations among governments and universities and businesses. So the state of New York decided we're going to buy, the state is going to buy uh, Coursera, access to Coursera for all unemployed people in New York. And they're working with the City University of New York system to make sure all the schools get the, the latest kind of online learning. And they're working with employment organizations in Manhattan and in Buffalo to make sure that those local jobs are getting the supply of talent out of the schools that have been upskilled with online learning. So collaborations among institutions, I think, pr- provides an incredible opportunity. And we're already starting to see that. Guy, do you agree with this? Who, I mean, who is meant to pay for it? And is there, like Jeff was pointing to, is there an ideal way of doing it? There is a violent agreement about the need uh, for lifelong learning systems to be put in place and for everybody to find a place in them. I think there are three subsequent questions where we're still struggling. The first is what do delivery systems for lifelong learning look like? And governments around the world are struggling with this. We need what uh, Sharon has referred to as scaffolding. We need some, something to build these things on. That's the first question. The second question is who's responsible? Who is responsible for lifelong learning provision? Uh, is it the state? Uh, is it private enterprise, private, uh, the private sector? And is it the individual working person themselves? And uh, the third question, of course, is who's going to pay for all of this? Where is the money coming from? If we can answer those three questions, we're going some way towards an answer. My view of that debate around the world, and I'm listening, and it's really encouraging to hear some of the enterprise initiatives that are being undertaken. But my impression around the world is that we're at the first stages of this debate. People are really understanding, and this conversation has brought out why they're understanding that this is really a a dramatically important challenge for for the world, given the extent of transformational change. You know, we all know that anything we learnt uh, at school, at college, doesn't last a lifetime. However well-educated we were at the beginning of a working life, it ain't going to last any of us for a lifetime. So we've really got to make a reality of all of this. Those are the three questions I think that matter. And if I can just add one further point, 
I think all the evidence shows that those in general who have skills are much better placed to acquire new skills in the course of a professional life. That's the way it goes. Those who don't have anything to get started with tend to be left out. It is leaving people behind. And it's a tough one, isn't it? And I, 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 But the answer to your question is we've all got a role in this, isn't it? I mean, it's clearly partnership. Uh, it, it's got to be the answer. I definitely want to make a comment. I also have Alan actually, you know, saying governments need to insist on measuring outcomes. We're almost out of time. So actually, I'm going to ask you each in 30 seconds to think of one or two priorities that you would either tell business leaders or world leaders that they need to focus on that you think they're leaving behind or not focusing on as much to make a real difference. Alan, you can go first. <clears throat> hmm. um, so... I think the most important thing is figuring out a way to make sure that the parts of the economy which are going well and the opportunities which are uh, coming to the people who are most in demand end up uh, being something which can be leveraged to move the whole economy forward. Um, one thing which could be done quickly, I think, in countries to do that is to uh, figure out a way to take the goodwill that exists at companies like Jim's uh, and like uh, Jeff's and mine, and turn it into um, uh, and, and figure out a way to magnify that goodwill to impact the society more broadly, help those companies work together. Sharon? I think that we have to be conscious of the investment in transitions, climate, technology, rebuilding, industry policy, whatever it is, that they can create jobs. But we've got to be conscious of making sure they do and that they're good jobs. We also have to recognise that skills is either a mindset or it's not. You know, again, lifelong learning goes right where at the first stage, but it's a 25-year-old concept, possibly a bit longer, and it is to be talked about from our, in our skills ecosystems discussions with employers in Australia. But it's also a productivity piece. If you think that investment in social protection pays for itself and then some in a multiplier impact, well, skills, structured skills investment does too. We got productivity in Australia with, with a skills program up to 17, point, uh, 17 percentage points of multi-factor productivity. When those partnerships indeed were eroded and the money fell out of structured uh, investment in skills, it went back to a 0.2%. Skills are critical, but they're also about prosperity and productivity as well as the individual. But please don't just focus on a skills deficit. It isn't just skills for today. It is a learning mentality that is about lifelong learning and it creates the environment where people actually believe that this is part of their job. Thank you, Jim. In thirty seconds, your priorities. Yeah, I'm, there's so many, uh, so many countries where you know the politics are just getting in the way of progress, and it's it's pitiful and upsetting to watch. And uh, I, I, you know, there's so many different examples, but I'll, I'll take the classic labor, you know, business antagonistic relationship that had developed in the from the formation of labor unions years ago. That needs to shift. That needs to be, become apolitical, much more uh, less in, uh, dependent on politics and much more focused on collaboration. Unlocking that could be an amazing, amazing force to deal with so many of the problems that we've been talking about. Thank you, Jeff. I'll have to echo that a little bit. I think it's important for every institution, whether you're a business, a government, or a university uh, or, or other, recognize the world's changing faster than it ever has before. That's only going to accelerate. The pandemic has been a step change in that rate of change. Uh, number two, it creates a lot of threats, but also a lot of opportunities. And although digital is not the only answer, to, to Alan's point, there's a lot of leverage in digital, and it's getting more leverage. The ability to learn new skills and do jobs remotely creates opportunities for leverage where you can get some good wins on modest investments. And then the third thing, and this is going to just be a shameless plug for the World Economic Forum, I do believe that institutional collaborations and communities where institutions can share not only challenges, but emerging solutions that are actually working are critical for rate of learning and rate of progress. So I would encourage all institutions, to, to Jim's point, collaborate, share ideas. We are finding solutions faster than we ever have before, not to every problem, but to a lot of very important problems 
And I think we're making great progress. And I appreciate World Economic Forum convening us all to share those solutions. Great. Just a guy in 20 seconds, and then we'll go to Klaus Schwab. Well, all of these ambitions sort of have to start now. And that's why it's so important that this recovery process builds in all of these great ideas and good intentions. And at the risk of sounding like a scratch record, today means getting those vaccines out equally. It means getting finance, resources and investment together. And it also means getting this sense of common purpose sort of infiltrated into policymaking. And uh, it's not always evident for reasons that have been alluded to that that is how the world is right now, but we can perhaps help that. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful panel. And uh, with that, for closing remarks, I'm delighted to welcome Klaus Schwab. Over to you. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating panel. And actually what we are discussing is part of uh, this effort to build back better, but I would also say to build back uh, broader. And for us at the World Economic Forum, recognizing that everything is interconnected, we actually have four big objectives. I think the world needs to move simultaneously in four directions. First, to make the world more sustainable. Of course, here's a drive to net zero. To make the world, as we discuss now, to make it uh, much more uh, inclusive. Number three, to make the world also more resilient, and it has been mentioned several times, um, because uh, we all know, and we have seen it with the, with the pandemic now, that the cost of inaction um, is much higher than the cost of taking the necessary, uh, afterwards uh, repairing. And I think uh, um, uh, Mr. Reiter, See, what you are saying related to vaccines is just a good example. If we uh, refer to the latest World Bank uh, IMF report, if we invest sufficiently into the distribution of vaccines, we can save probably quite a lot of money. But the fourth dimension in this, um, let's say, effort to, to, to create a um, better and broader uh, global recovery, I think the, the fourth dimension is, of course, technology. Uh, we have to make the world not only more sustainable, more inclusive, more resilient, but also smarter. We have to use the technologies to, I think you, uh, Guy, you said to, even today, you said in, in, uh, in a meeting, uh, to build a human center recovery strategy. Now, what we wanted to achieve with this uh, job summit is to create the awareness for the urgent need uh, to join in a global jobs recovery plan. And here, let me just um, uh, enumerate some dimensions of such a recovery plan. First, I think we have to imagine the economy uh, not only of tomorrow, but the economy, how it could look like or how it should look like in 20, 30 years from now, because people entering now the job market, uh, they will need the skills for the next 40, 50 years. Now, what economy do we really want to have? And my feeling is that we are moving and should move from an economy which is based mainly on producing to an co economy which should be mainly based on caring. Uh, the Forum has um, undertaken some research work to, to define 20 new markets which are really much more in the era of uh, taking care of people, taking care of the planet. The second point I want to raise is, of course, the reskilling and upskilling. Um, people, if they are really uh, well skilled, they can be the accelerators uh, to bring about the world which we and the economy which we really aim for. Um, let me just finalize maybe what we need is also a new mindset. Uh, it has been mentioned, uh, we in the business world, we see now 
that companies who are not committed to ESG metrics, to stakeholder capitalism, uh, just to stakeholder capitalism, that um, those companies are on the wrong side of history. But it's not only companies. I think we also have to ask the question how we can apply the ESG metrics even to governments to, uh, because uh, it's not just GDP. It's well-being, it's prosperity. And I'm coming back to, to, to ESGs, I think um, I'm happy to see uh, now um, when I look at our partner companies and how we increase the number of our partner companies, I see that this philosophy, this commitment uh, to do not only well, but to do good, to do good for people and for the planet is now becoming mainstream. And I want to conclude by thanking everybody in this panel because I think uh, if everybody in the world would uh, think alike, we would be a massive force, as it has been mentioned, for change. And I want to thank uh, also particularly Sadia um, Sahidi, who is our managing director, who is actually the driving force in all our efforts to create a new society and a new economy, which is, and I repeat, more sustainable, more equitable, more resilient, and also smarter. Thank you.